Now to please welcome Charles Colborn. Thank you, Max. You're Ah, oh, it is so good to be doing this again and, uh, and to see all of you here. Uh, you look absolutely gorgeous. Um, when I come to, to conferences like this one, uh, this is the question. It doesn't matter what I'm talking about that I get asked more than any other. How do I make my company more customer-centric? How do I, I change the organization, get them to listen to me? And um, that's something that I've been lucky enough to be involved in throughout my career, uh, right from the very first job I have to today when I'm conducting a study with a couple of hundred companies right across Europe to, to measure how customer-centric they are and to help them benchmark themselves against each other. Uh, so when Andreas invited me to, to speak, I said, well, th this is the question that people keep asking. I think we should, we should just begin by trying to answer that question. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a very large US retailer, and I was talking to the senior leadership team, and I asked them this question, well, how customer-centric do you think you are? And they said, oh, we're really customer-centric. We have amazing tools for social media listening. I was like, well, that's, that's not really what being customer-centric is about. I'm, we kind of know, okay, this is, this is what it's not. But here's the question, you know, what, what does a customer-centric company actually look like? One CEO I spoke to put it really bluntly. He said, look, everybody talks about how they want to be customer-centric. Every, every other CEO I know says, oh, we want to be customer-centric. But nobody can actually explain what that means. And, and if we're going to help an organization to become more customer-centric, we've really got to have some sort of vision of, of what that means. And, and it's not just about us. It's not just about the, the UX team or the design team. Um, you know, if the entire organization is going to become customer-centric, then that's got to mean something to the finance team. What does a, a customer-centric finance team look like? How will they need to change. It's not about the whole organization just coming to us and saying, oh, UX team, tell us what to do. We wouldn't want that anyway. We'd be overwhelmed. So, so what does it mean if that sort of thinking is permeating through an entire organization? Well, I think as well as our practice, there are other quite well-established areas of practice that, that have something to say about customer centricity. And so when I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, what's this vision of what a customer-centric organization might look like, I'm really trying to draw on three areas of practice. So those are you know, agile, which is mostly about software engineering, um, lean, which is about operations and processes, and of course, user-centered design. And, and our superpower is being able to say, hey, this is what the future might look like. We can, we can draw you a picture of what the future might look like. Uh, each of those uh, different disciplines has a quite well-established body behind it, but at the center of all of them is this sort of common set of values. And, and they are, I mean, first of all, they're all concerned about delivering user value. You look at the Agile Manifesto, or you think about lean processes, and you very quickly come across this idea of user value is the thing that we're trying to achieve. They're all evidence-based. So they all have this idea of, OK, you have a hypothesis, but now go out and find the evidence to prove or, or disprove it. And they're all iterative. They all say, well, we're going to take a thing and we're going to improve on it until it's good enough. And there's this idea of kind of continuous improvement baked in. And so if you're thinking about, well, what does a customer-centric organization look like? What you're really saying is everybody in the organization is working around these principles. And their practice, their day-to-day -day activities are governed by these sorts of ideas. And that's enough of a vision, I suppose, for, for us to get started. The, the other thing is, of course, you, you don't just go from zero to completely user-centered. There's this idea of, of UX maturity, that you start off and there's not very much being done, and then there's a little being done, and then there's lots of stuff being done. It's really mature. Uh, and there are lots of different 
models of, of design maturity or UX maturity in our field. This is um, one that you might have come across already. It's one of the, the most popular. Uh, it's the Nielsen Norman Group's model of, of UX maturity. Now, I have to say, I think these models all oversimplify what's going on. Changing organizations is very complicated, and there are a lot of moving parts, but we only have about 20 minutes uh, to talk about it, and so this is a good kind of simple framework we can, we can use at least for now. Um, and, and as you see, there's that idea that you, know, you start off and there's no or very little ux -y stuff being done. And then you get to the middle and it's kind of a bit more structured and it's being done in a kind of a systematic way. And then there's something that happens over here. It's just lovely. Um, and the other thing is you'll see that the, the barriers that you need to overcome at every step change. That what you need to move from one level to the next changes as you get more mature. So to the answer to that question of how do I make my organization more customer centric really changes at each step in the process. Very early on, this is one of the, the questions that comes up an awful lot. You know, like how do I get my boss to, to listen to me? You know, I, I say, hey, you know, I've got this UX stuff and it's really good. And my boss goes, yeah, it's really good. And uh, I say, our users are, are really important. Yeah, they're really important. And then I say, so I'd like to do this. My boss says, well, something else is more important right now, actually. Please don't. How do I get my boss to, to listen to me? Well, the, the answer, I think, is if you want anybody to listen to you, you have to begin by listening to them. You have to begin by, by understanding them, understanding what they need, why they're doing the things that they're doing. And in my experience, you, you can't make change happen until you first of all stop and understand what it is that the other people around you want and what's driving them. And if you listen to them and, or <clears throat> and say, well, what is it that you want? Or even better, if you say to your boss, what does your boss want? What's going to impress the person that you're trying to impress? You'll, you'll probably hear a bunch of stuff like this. I'm not really interested in, in UX. I need to lower the cost of maintenance, or uh, I need to get faster time to market. And, and you'll start to hear these things. Of course, the great thing is, our practice absolutely helps these things happen. I've, over the course of my career, I've been involved in projects where I can point to and say, yes, we made that happen by applying our principles, by applying our way of working. But once you've understood what matters to your boss, you can line up and say, OK, I'm going to help you do that, and here's how. You might be tempted to just say, OK, well, let's take this list. I'm going to email that list to my boss and say, look at all the things I can do. Please listen to me. Please let me do these things. And that would be a mistake. Because your boss is going to go, well, yeah, I, I want faster time to market. But Giles is doing a little bit of faster time to market. And he's doing all these other things as well. So I'm going to go to somebody who's only talking about faster time to market. If you feature dump, if you say, here's a list of all the things I can do, please pick one your boss is going to think it's only a little bit of what you do and is not going to listen to you. So you have to begin by listening. You have to begin by saying, tell me what's important, and then focusing and aligning your work to that. And that will get their attention. And you can demonstrate results, and you can show evidence that your work contributes to this, either because you've got a case study, or a colleague has a case study, or you found a blogger out there online who can demonstrate this is how it works. You've got evidence, and so you'll, uh, you'll be listened to. Um, as people kind of move out of those very early stages, and first get to start deploying UX skills and, and UX practice in an organization, they, they, the, the question really changes. And it becomes, well, how do, I, how do I get to do strategic work? How do I get to show that I can play this on a bigger field, that there are the decisions around what's going on that I can, can work with? And um, I think that's really interesting, because what they're asking really is, how do I change my role? How do I change what I'm doing? And when you, you change your role, when, when you make change in your life, that, that means letting go of something very often. It means you need to stop doing something. If I think about how my career has, has changed over the years, 
very often, in order to grow, in order to move into the next thing, in order to move up to the next level, I've had to let go of the thing that I think defines me. And you have to be prepared to do that if, if you want to, to change yourself and to grow with the organization. Um, one of the design leaders uh, I've, I've been speaking to explained it like this. He said, well, I wanted my team to be working on more strategic stuff. So the first thing we had to do was make space for that new work. And that meant we had to stop doing some of the user testing. So we trained the engineering team. We trained the developers to do some of their own user testing. And that gave us time and space to move on to the stuff that we did want to do. Handing over what makes you special to somebody else allows you to grow. As you do that, you're going to start to, to change the sorts of artifacts that you, that you create. You're going to create things like this. Instead of looking at a usability problem, you're looking at an entire, well, what I call an experience map. Um, so you're looking at, OK, let's think about everything that the user is thinking and doing and seeing across this entire service or experience. And let's think about all of the things that we do. And let's, let's think about where the pain points come and where there are opportunities to change and what we know about the users. You'll map out the entire thing. Um, we're really lucky that I think the, the very best person in the world to talk about how you create this is talking at the conference tomorrow. So Indy Young's book, Mental Models, is absolutely the best book I've come across on how to create these kinds of, uh, these kinds of maps. And uh, gosh, if you get a chance to talk to her in the Q&A, do. Um, otherwise, read her book. Um, but an experience map lets you start to see the bigger picture, so it lets you start to have that kind of strategic vision. And you can start to do things like um, overlay business metrics on the user experience. So you can say, oh, look, this is really interesting. We can see a big drop in the number of people using our product and service right at this point where we can also see a pain point in user testing. And you can start to prioritize where money and time and effort get spent. And you can track changes over time, so you can demonstrate a return on investment for UX. Those are the sorts of activities and behavior that elevate you into that, that strategic world. As people get into that sort of space, they say, you know, I want to be able to fail. I want to have the chance to, to try something and fail at it. And my organization won't let me do that. So how do I get permission to fail? And my answer to that is, are you out of your mind? That is a crazy thing to ask your boss to do. It's, it's listening to the UX jargon and listening to the UX hype and, and believing it. Nobody will ever say, I want you to go out and fail. When we talk about the need to fail and failing fast and those sorts of things, you've got to remember these are, these are slogans. These are eye-catching ways we talk to each other about something interesting. They're not the objective. Nobody's objective is to fail. Your objective is to succeed. Um, what we're really saying is well, we need to try things and learn from them. And so don't ask for permission to fail. Ask for permission to experiment. Say to your boss, can I try a few little things to see which works best so we can do that, so we can optimize, so we can be sure of success? Can I try some experiments to remove some risk from this project? If you put it that way, your boss will always say, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Little quick experiments to find out what works best, we'll do that. Um, Speaking as somebody who understands this jargon, when I have had people come to me in the past and say, hey, we need to fail more, it's scared the hell out of me because it's made me think, well, they're not really thinking about what needs to happen, which is success, which is learning. So make sure you don't get caught up in the hype. Um, at, at this stage, as you're moving through that sort of, you know, from, from strategy, what, what you're, you're really doing is creating UX processes that are about, OK, how do we wrap in this idea of experiment and, and learn into UX processes? And here's uh, a, a common one. There's an awful lot of, of documentation and talk uh, in our field about UX processes. So this is the Discover Alpha Beta process, very popular in the UK. Uh, you probably use something, if not it, then something very like it yourself. 
Um, and it's really about saying, okay, different stages of the project have different types of risk associated with them. And at each stage, we're going to make sure we eliminate the risk that's appropriate to that stage. So in the discovery stage, the risk is that we, we start off trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Or in the alpha stage, we, we come up with a solution that isn't the best solution. Putting processes like this in place elevates you again. You're no longer really doing use at UX management. If you're running a process like this, you're probably doing something that looks more like product management. As, as the organization uh, has become more sophisticated in its, in its thinking, you've evolved with it again. So again, you've let go of something and you've moved into a different space. And then everything seems to stop. I think what's really remarkable is the number of people who say, OK, we have managed to improve our UX maturity, and we've got to this level. We've got to this sort of systematic level of level four, and we can't seem to break through. There's a, there's a barrier here. And as I say, I see an awful lot of us um, you know, talking about these UX processes, and we're running these UX processes, and we're saying, gosh, all of the stakeholders outside of our, of our project are just throwing rocks at us all the time. And they're doing things that are knocking us off course. And they're, they're asking us questions or want us to do things that just feel like the wrong things. What that is, is a problem of governance. It's no longer a problem of UX process, it's a problem of UX governance, a problem of, of how the organization is trying to make sure that its projects are delivering. And while I see an awful lot of UX people talking about UX processes, I see very little on this is what a user-centered governance structure should look like. And that's really where that next breakthrough occurs. It's the point at which you're saying, OK, how, do, how should our projects be run? Um, often you'll find that the governance frameworks that exist in a, in a company are unwritten. Um, but sometimes they're written down. Some organizations have them absolutely laid out for you. A few years ago, I went to a financial services company, and they were saying, well, our projects just keep failing, they keep overrunning, they're not delivering what we want, um, and um, you know, we need you to, to help us to fix that. Uh, meanwhile, they were really proud of their governance framework. They said, this is our governance framework, and it keeps us safe. It means that we know that our projects are going to work. I was like, the, the projects that you say are failing at the moment? Let's have a look at these governance rules. And when I looked at the governance rules, what I saw was an awful lot of, OK, you need to check these decisions with somebody higher up the chain. And what was happening was that decisions and pieces of work were being passed up and up the chain. And you had some of the most senior people in the organization actually making decisions about the user interface or about tiny little details on the project. This, the governance framework was all about creating hierarchy. And it wasn't about those three principles that we began with. It wasn't about, has this team identified user value? It wasn't about, is this team showing evidence behind its decisions? And it wasn't about, is this team building on what they know works? And using that to springboard themselves forward. A user-centered governance framework looks something like that. And if you want your team to kind of grow beyond level four, you need to start thinking about, about that sort of stuff. Once you've put something like that in place, you can do remarkable things. So you can say, OK, well, let's create a dashboard. Let's see how well all of the work that's going on in our organization is performing. So we've got this many active projects, which, which are at this stage in the process, and we've checked them against our governance rules, and we can see that these, that these projects are doing just fine. We don't need to throw any rocks at them. And this project is not. And this project is the one where we need to intervene, and we need to intervene in these sorts of ways. So you give people the right rocks to throw at the right projects. If you think about that evolution, you think about that, that evolution from low maturity to high maturity, you see that at, at each stage you're kind of working with different stuff. At the very early stages, you're thinking about, well, what are the skills and tools that a practitioner might need? Then you start to think about processes, and then you get to the really interesting stuff where you're going, okay, what are the governance that sits around that? 
And, and finally, you're, you're thinking about, OK, well, what's the, the structure of an organization and the culture? And these sorts of things are owned by the, the chief executives of the organization. Structure is about who reports to whom. How do we manage and control the organization? And for a user-centered organization, you'd say, well, the people who are in charge of the user experience need to be reporting right to the top. You know, that product management needs to be reporting into the CEO. Um, and the culture of an organization? Well, culture really just emerges from what gets rewarded around here. What does this organization genuinely value? So if an organization values hierarchy, you will get a hierarchical organization. If people get rewarded for shouting in meetings, you'll get a lot of people shouting in meetings. And if people get rewarded for identifying user value and making evidence-based decisions and iterating, you will get an organization that's user-centered. Culture really begins with the CEO. And the org chart really begins with the CEO. If, if you're going to change an organization at that scale, you need to be talking to the CEO, and you need the CEO to be at changing the way that he or she acts and behaves. And that's the fact of it. But those are the tools that you're looking to operate on. And if that seems a, a little bit distant and a little bit hard to achieve, well, let me give you an example of, of when somebody has achieved that. So, when my friend Lisa Reichert joined the Government Digital Service, she looked around her and she said, gosh, as an organization, we are actually already very good at talking about user value. She, she listened to the, to the CEO. She listened to what was being said in the organization. She said, we talk a lot about user value, but gosh, we don't seem to do any user testing. And how can we know what user value is if we're not talking to our users. And she put that to the, to the leadership of the organization. She said, look, here's a problem. Here's something that you believe in. Here's what you want. And here's how my practice, user research, can support that and make that change. And by listening and aligning what she did to what they wanted, they said, OK, yes, you need to go out and make that change. And so she said, OK, well, I'm going to make a rule that everybody who works here can't go more than X days without watching some user research. It doesn't matter who you are. If you go more than X days and you haven't watched some user research, that gets written into your personnel file. And suddenly, people were like, oh, gosh, this organization really cares about user research. And they went along to user research, and they got involved in user research, and they realized this is really useful. And today, I don't think anyone can remember a time when the government digital service in the UK didn't care deeply about user research. But it began, really, with, with Lisa talking to the organizational leadership and saying, we need a cultural change here. What that says to me is, you know what, the, the simplest tools in our toolkit, the simple user test, is something that's powerful enough to change an entire organization. And we've seen that power, I'm sure, in our work time and time again. And listening, well, you know, that's, that's again one of those tools that we already have. We're already good at it. It's part of our practice. We just need to apply it to the situations we find ourselves in. You already have the tools, the skills, the knowledge to move yourself up that ladder and to take your organization with you and to transform your organization. It's hard work, and it's a long journey, but my goodness, it's worthwhile. And I wish you every success in doing that. Thank you. Whenever I talk at one of these things, I always like to, to provide a reading list. So here are some, some books which I think touch on some of the topics um, that I've mentioned. Um, there are some ones that maybe you won't have come across. Uh, the Advantage is, is a terrific book for corporate leadership, and actually it's a way of getting any group of people to do, uh, to, to align around a simple idea. Uh, org design for design orgs will, will help you do things like understand how organization charts work and what looks good in a, in a design organization. Never Split the Difference is a great book about negotiating and getting what you want. And guess what? 
it begins with listening. Um, and I mentioned Indy Young's book. So uh, I hope those are useful to you. We should have some questions, though, shouldn't we? Yes. Um, you can uh, go to Slido if you want to type in questions, or you can ask them here. So uh, please raise your hand. We will bring you a microphone. Who uh, would like to start with the first question? There are two types of questions I love. The question which is, Giles, you've got this completely wrong. And the question where you're like, gosh, I think everyone else in the room knows this, but, uh, but I don't. Uh, here's a really stupid question. Um, so anything, please. Hi. Hi there. Thank you for talk, reading <laughs> Um You started off talking about design UX, and it felt like the word product blurred in more and more into that as you moved up the org. Yeah. Want to talk about the relationship between product teams and UX teams? Ooh. Um, well, I think that's part of that evolution, isn't it? Um, that that as you as as you kind of expand what it is that you're you're thinking about, um, that absolutely the, the role changes. And um, so so yes, I think that a product manager is very largely concerned with, um, with creating and curating uh, a user experience. It's not the only thing, and that product manager also needs to start to think about, okay, well, what does that mean for marketing? But hey, shouldn't your marketing be user-centered? And they need to think about engineering. But as we've seen, there's a set of practices around that. So absolutely, you're right. You're, you know, as, as you move up that maturity, you know, you're expanding the number of things that you need to touch. But, but hopefully, what you're also doing is, is keeping true to those, uh, to those principles uh, and saying, OK, well, if we're going to do marketing, we should be following lean marketing practices. And you get to influence um, that stuff. And you know, I mean, we finished with the role of the CEO. And absolutely, the role of the CEO is to, is to create value in the organization. And, and at that point, what you're doing is you're saying, OK, our organization works by creating value like this in a customer-centric way. So yes, um, you know, the roles absolutely change. But I think you can take the practice uh, and apply it at each step. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. First of all, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, I actually have one question regarding when you are in a startup or building a startup, um, you are constantly have to decide which things to prioritize. And in our team, I want to prioritize UX for, from the beginning on. Uh, which kind of processes would you recommend to start where, very early on without over engineer it? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, thank you. That's a, so, so that's a, a, you know, making sure that those ideas are kind of baked in from the, from the absolute yeah. start. Um, I think the great thing about startup is everything is within reach. I mean, certainly in the early stages, anyway. And, um, and that makes it relatively straightforward to, to say, OK, are we doing these things? I would go back to those principles. Um, in a startup where you know, everything is kind of blurred into one, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a little harder to see process kind of dissected in, in the way that you see it when you've got a, a very large team. Um, you know, when, when I started CX Partners, one of the principles was we will only do work where we get to talk to users. And, and we would say that to our clients. And you know, so that became absolutely baked into the organization. And I don't even need to think about it or, or ask people about it today. Uh, it's just so deeply baked into the organization. So I would perhaps begin with principles before you start to, to wrap process around it. Um, and then I'd also be thinking about, um, you know, there are great books like Lean Startup and Lean UX. Which um, you know, which really apply to, to that situation. To answer your question, I mean, what what sort of things? Where would you say, from your point of view, where's the sort of the big question mark? Um, 
the big question mark was for me like, oh, let's um, say from another standpoint, um, I introduced some principles first, as you mentioned before, that uh, when we are uh, develop features or think about features that we have to have the user constantly in our mind mm -hmm. because this is especially ca uh, the case because we are developing a VR app and VR is quite <laughs> <laughs> an experimental field. So I thought this would be a good idea to do it first. Mm -hmm. But I was interested how professional UX designers are okay. approaching this kind of process um, when they start from zero, so, so yeah. to say, and then um, build it up constantly. That's great. So I love that. And I think that's a great principle to, um, to adopt. And, and you're absolutely right, especially in a new field where it isn't sort of just written down. Here's how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think when you're taking a principle and putting it into practice, the next thing is, OK, how do we do this rigorously? Like, what does this really mean? So you take a principle like keep the user in mind. And it, it can easily start to be stretched by people and used for their own ends. And uh, in, um, in his book, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum, uh, Alan Cooper talks about the idea of the elastic user. You know, that, um, that when you sit around a meeting table, you sit at a meeting table, you go around that table, what the user wants generally tends to be whatever the person who's speaking wants. <laughs> Okay. Um, and, you know, the, well, I think the user wants oh, The user wants this. And what they mean is, I think the user wants this. And what they really mean is, I have a hypothesis that the user wants this, but no evidence. Okay, so you, when you're taking a principle like that of, okay, keep the user in mind, you have to pin it down and say, okay, how are we going to keep the user in mind? Well, we're going to find out. And we, go, you know, and when somebody says the user wants this, you go, "That's interesting. Show me how. How do you know that? Where does that come from?" Um, and primary research absolutely trumps opinion. Um, but I think that's that's the trick with principles: is you need, you know, you need to be principled about your principles, and you need to be super rigorous about: is this being twisted? Is somebody using this principle, yeah. or do they really mean it? Um, and that's where you, you, you get to it. And you have to be quite mean about it. You have to be quite kind of black and white um, in order to get it kind of baked in. I hope that's useful. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Great question. Thank you. Hi. Yes, please. I'm just going to make him walk as far as we can. Thank you. Um, so I work in an organization that used to be a startup. We were all about lean design thinking, et cetera. Um, now we are integrating into a big corporate and we are implementing the SAFE framework. <laughs> so agile, not agile. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes, no, no, can you elaborate? That's fine. Oh, well done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm not sure I think I might have let know. those thoughts out. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, gosh, so that is tricky, isn't it? Um, what to say about that? Um, well, what? So, where would you like to go with that? What is the? So, yes, I think you know, safe. That's it. Looks like agile, but it's not agile, and that's the problem. Explaining that to people who who are like, yeah, but these big organisations use it. Um, so I completely get that. What, what's the What's the problem for you here specifically? I think one of the key things that we noticed is that there is very little mention of the user at all mm, mm. and of UX in general. There are like a couple of add-ons to that framework that are like, oh yeah, we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah, yeah. So how, what it would be your advice to make sure that, you know, when we do talk to the CEO, CEO mm. um, how do we make sure that we stay on the map and that we get integrated into this framework in a productive way? Okay. Yeah, so that's complicated because you have something really big that the organization has bought into, you probably spent a lot of money on expensive training courses and, and you're kind of cut out. And so, yeah, you just have to go, okay, this is going to take a long time to fix and it is going to take time to unpick. And I think when you're, you're trying to improve anything, um, it's important to be easy on yourself and to say, okay, I know this is going to take time. 
Um, and, and it's not about getting to perfection. It's just about making things a little bit better every day. So, uh, and so write that down, and it will keep you sane. Um, and then I think um, the, the good thing is that you have reality on your side, okay? <laughs> that if people are doing things without consulting users, they're going to come off the production line and break. Um, and, and you can take that very simple tool that we have of a user test and say, oh, you know what, I just thought I'd show it to some users and I videotaped it and here's that videotape and look at this. Or I'm going to show it to some users in the lunch break, come along with me. You don't have to do an awful lot, but showing them a little glimpse of reality will make them think, oh, there's something that we're missing here. Um, and so, you know, trying to get reality in as early as possible, <laughs> I think, is helpful. Um, the other thing that you have on your side is, is the, the Agile manifesto, right? So, safe is our way of implementing Agile. Oh, okay, so Agile's the thing that we're doing. Oh, here's the Agile manifesto. Oh, here are things that are in the Agile manifesto that we're not doing. So you can go back to the source and say, oh, there's a gap here. Let me, let me help you to, to fill that gap. Uh, let me help you add the thing on that, that you need to do. Um, and, and that's maybe the, you know, the, the other place that you can go. But I, I absolutely agree. Um, Jared Spool says, you know, when, when somebody wants to stick a bean up their nose, they will stick a bean up their nose as hard as they can. And it's only when it starts hurting that you go, let me help you with that. So, so you might have to also wait for a little bit of, of pain. But as I say, you can use user testing to create that pain a little earlier. Um, but yeah, it's a long journey you're on. Good luck. Thank you for those answers. Thank you. So thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I really love it that you are a very active audience. Yeah, thank I you. I didn't have to ask my prepared question. Thank you, Charles, for having this uh, Thank you talk. very much. Was... OK, well, I'll take that. Thanks.